practice soon. Okay, are we ready? All right, cool. I know right here, you know, you know me. Um, so again, yeah, Dale Hendricks from uh, uh, Gentalk Systems. And um, I'm gonna talk about Toad today. And uh, the title of the talk is A Long and Winding Toad. And the Toad has been a long time in development and gone through a number of different phases as I, you know, discovered what it's supposed to be. And uh, so um, part of this talk, I'm gonna go back in history and talk about where it came from and how we moved forward and then and get into um, Toad itself. So, um, to start with, I guess Glass and Gem Tools was introduced back in 2007, so that's like seven years ago. Um, Glass stands for uh, Gemstone, Linux, Apache, Seaside, and Smalltalk. We shipped a VMware appliance that had everything installed on it, um, and uh, Gem Tools was the development environment. It was uh, based on OmniBrowser. So uh, that was 2007, and that was, you know, a nice self-contained system for building seaside applications. Um, in two, by 2011, um, OmniBrowser support started fading, all right? It was uh, falling out of favor um, in, the, in the community, which meant that we were stranded with gem tools back in an environment that wasn't going to keep moving forward, all right? Um, Plus, Gem Tools um, has poor performance over the land. Um, the, um, if you're familiar with Gemstone, it does not have a native GUI. So, um, in order to uh, have a GUI in a development environment, you have to have a remote client running over a wire. And typically, your Gemstone server is out, out somewhere in a server and your clients in your local office. So, um, and the split point for OmniBrowser was at the uh, change method. And if you're familiar with the way um, a lot of uh, GUIs work in Smalltalk, where you do update and changes, and uh, you change your model, the update message is sent to the, to the view, and, up, and it gets updated. Well, with OmniBrowser, that update change messages were passed across the wire. And OmniBrowser happened to be very, very chatty when it, when it came to events. So if you had a window that had multiple buttons, the entire set of events were passed for each button. So it got to be over a LAN to be almost unusable for gem tools. So um, that brings us to um, 2011, where it became necessary to really come up with some replacement for gem tools and start thinking about that. Um, so the first, my first cut was to do a seaside-based uh, development environment. And uh, this is just a picture of, from, of, of that. Um, and that means we had things running in a web browser and, and using Seaside. And I had never seen um, a uh, code browser, a class browser in a web, in a web browser that I liked. Because um, you, know, you like to have lots of windows and push windows around when you're working with a class browser. You don't have windows in, in a web browser. So, yeah, so I decided rather than attempt to do something that I didn't like in the first place, I started and did something completely different with Toad. And uh, you know, so I didn't try to duplicate the, the, the development environment or the, the, the classic development environment. <clears throat> so um, the good news was I found out a lot of interesting things by doing this prototype. The bad news was that um, doing a debugger in, implemented in Seaside for a Seaside application for doing development in Seaside meant that um, if you put a self fault in your Seaside code, the, your development environment also stopped. So that was that was a big uh, you know a big bug boost for trying to do to do Seaside based development environment. Um, the second thing that, that came into uh, that hit me when I was doing this was. Um, you know, this, this, you're talking about that client here, okay? Um, where, where in this, I think if you saw the client presentation, you know, the current model of uh, JavaScript in the browser and uh, server-side, um, you know, just uh, managing, managing the model itself, leads to the need to write code in two different environments. Your browser environment, so tools written in the browser are gonna be written in JavaScript. And the information on the server is gonna be written as a server. But, this is a small talk development environment, okay? It's not like you sit down and go, 
I've got a, um, uh, you know, a bank application and I know what the GUI is going to look like and it's going to be fixed and we'll hire a bunch of JavaScript programmers or to do that work. This is a development environment that I want small talk developers who are doing an application that may or may not be Seaside, uh, may, or not, may, may or may not be JavaScript based, to be able to write tools and develop those tools. So having a fat client where you sit down and say, okay, go develop code over there on the, on the, on the, on the client and hook that up to the server is just unnecessary complication. So, and that was something, again, that I learned um, in doing the Seaside uh, version of Toad. So, um, uh, and this is why I, I went through this here. And uh, you shouldn't need a PhD to be able to write, write tools in Smalltalk. So, um, you know, I basically um, also started to go on a kind of a jihad against the standard Smalltalk development tools. The Smalltalk browser has been around for 30 years, all right? And there are good things about it and there are bad things about it. Um, workspaces, the same thing, the debugger. There are these in, in, in independent monolithic tools. And, you know, talking about PhDs, if you want to go extend the browser, you pretty much have to learn how to get a PhD in the browser. You want to extend the debugger or play with the debugger, get a PhD in the debugger, okay? If you want to use features from the debugger, you have to learn how the debugger works before you can actually make an API call. So these were things that, you know, uh, as I started basically building a small talk development environment from the ground up, I started thinking about it because I really didn't want to go and say, oh, I'll just build browsers and debugger and I'm out of here, you know, I'm done. So, um, so, I'm gonna <laughs> so I started looking at, at different alternatives. Um, so then uh, 2012, and um, then I had the problem with the debugger. And Gemstone itself, I mentioned earlier that Gemstone doesn't have a native GUI, but it does have a command line interface called Topaz. So um, in 2012, I thought, well, I'll build um, a Topaz running in Barrow. Now our Topaz is written in C using a GCI, which is the communication protocol um, between uh, two different processes. So um, you know, GemTools runs with the GCI as well. So, I was going to just sit down and put Faro there, pull in the GemTools GCI code, and just do something simple like Topaz. And, but Faro is a windowing environment. Smalltalk is a window. You want windows in your universe in, uh, when you're working with Smalltalk. So I couldn't help myself. Um, if you look down here, I'll, I'll show a, 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 a one here that the Topaz users will recognize. But basically, I couldn't help myself, and I built a class browser. Um, but I built it as not a traditional class browser. I built it out of multiple windows. So I have a class hierarchy window here. Here's our definition window here. Um, instance and class methods in two different windows. I hate having to press the button in the middle to switch between oh, contexts. Yeah, nice. I hate having to press the button to find the definition of the class. So, you know, I, you know, in, in, in you know, the, the part of the jihad of the Smalltalk browser, anti-browser stuff, as I remember back before I learned Smalltalk, I used Emacs. And it had a nice layout, all right? And you could pop around the named buffers and stuff. Well, <laughs> and so I kind of said, well, this won't work, this doesn't work for Smalltalk, all right? Because you do want to have, you know, kind of this layout. But the idea, these are named buffers, okay? They just happen to be in a, I have named locations and named <coughs> buffers, all right? And much like Emacs, I sit down and say, hey, Put this in this named location, all right? Or it's named windows and named locations. If I put it in a named window, then the same window gets used over and over again. Window clutter, out the window, all right? <laughs> um, if I put it in a named location, then I get a stack of windows, but they're all in one spot, okay? So, um, so I really liked this kind of, uh, you know, interface, all right? But I had no menus in in back in those days, because I just sat down and said I'm going to do this very simple, and uh, you know, and not try to get too far ahead of myself and build things from a, from the ground up. So um, just to repeat, the lesson here was I'm going with a very thin Toad client. All right, I have two window types. I have list and text. Um, these single pane windows mean that I have pretty good control over my network round trips. Unlike in the on the browser based uh, system where an event would trigger thousands of events to bounce and ping pong back and forth across the web, um, 
you know, the single pane, I sit down and I say refresh. I don't have automatic updating yet. But you say refresh to the window, it says request its contents, it comes across and, and draws. So, but you have control, was the point. And um, what I pass back and forth is a window specification. Okay? So instead of HTML or XML, I'm using Stone, the small talk, uh, what is it, the small talk object notation. So it's based on JSON, but it can actually build small talk objects because the class is included as part of the specification. So I pass back the contents, menus, and actions. I know, you know, so what I pass across, Gemstone has object IDs for all the objects in the, in the database. So I'm doing something that I think, you know, um, my Gemstone colleagues will sit down and cringe about. I pass oops around. <laughs> it's called oop phishing, and it's not, you know, but, you know, this is a development environment. Um, and, uh, anyway, um, I pass oops across to the, to the, to the client side. All right, so I have all the object IDs, and so I can send messages over GCI. So things are built over here, like this list here is a block that exists on the server. The code was written on the server. I send the OOP over to this window, and I send value to the block, and it returns a stone representation of the result, which happens to be, for a list window, a list of strings, and laid out you know, nicely. And that's all done on the server. So no client code to sit down and have to mess with this. It's just you pass a list back, and then I've got code blocks, all right? So I've got a block for save, I've got a block for cancel, and the, the blocks are all executing on the server. You know? and, uh, and, but I'm, I'm passing objects back and forth to, to, the, to the client, but the, these objects are specifications. So um, this turns out to you know, be that dream of mine, which is we have a remote development environment that um, doesn't require users to write client-side code to do any GUI information. Now, yeah, it's a limited set, but that limited set can be expanded. Okay. Um, so, let's see. So, when I came back, uh, you know, so um, for the Topaz users out there, oh yeah, I input, input um, set project or set class, and then I added the edit edit things, and that's that's all I've gotten to in there. And it wasn't it wasn't enough. There was promise in an evaluator, all right? And in Smalltalk, we don't have a command line interface, all right, as a standard part of our, of our universe. And I really started, you know, you know, this was the starting point that obviously I didn't start there going, hey, I know, you know, in 2011 I said, hey, if I had command lines in Smalltalk, that would be cool. But, you know, I backed into it. You know, this was more of a discovery process, which is the long and winding code. Um, so, um, it evolved, okay, that evaluator evolved into an object shell. So as I sat there thinking about how should I model this command line interface that I think I want, um, I basically said, okay, let's just use the Unix shell as a model, all right? Um, commands have POSIX style argument handling, so you have a command, arguments, hit return, off you go. Um, the trick, though, is you don't use bash to implement your scripts. You use small talk. In fact, a script is really a, a command line callable workspace. All right. So, um, and oh, well, let's add in some directory structure. All right, because that's also part of the Unix model. I can CD around. I can have hierarchical structures, but don't use files. Use objects. All right. So I have a directory node, and I have multiple flavors of leaf nodes for the different types of objects that I want to store in my system. And um, that, like I say, I backed into this. I, this is not like, oh, brilliant idea, I'll do this. It was more just discovering how that really should look and what might happen piece by piece. And so here's the percentage too far. So, so this is an example of the current uh, object shell usage. I have a CD slash home. Oh, and I forgot. Um, it's not standard, standard in and standard out in Unix is a byte stream, you can get bytes back and forth. So in, in an object shell, what do you get? Objects, all right? So you have objects in and objects out. So when I run CD home, I get returned, well that's a gateway node. Special kind of leaf node, I won't get into that. I'm not gonna get into it today, but if anybody wants to know, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, LS, list of contents of the directory. 
um, dot dot slash st. So basically a star following this means it's executable. Right? And the dot st uh, returns the small integer 7. And if we edit st, we have down here the uh, script, which is a block. And pass in Topaz, which is the, you know, the master, master server um, object in. Um, actually, tokens is no longer needed because I pass in an object that's the command that has all that, the, the, the positive style uh, options in it. And then the command node is the actual node that, that, that we built there. And so I put a 3 plus 4, and that's, how, that's writing the script. All right? So, um, you know, very simple, very straightforward. This is saved to an object structure, your, your .st. Um, I guess I will wander into the game and then just for um, one, of the, one of the problems that, that I have is um, you have multiple images okay, that you're running with. All right? And you have objects that you want to share, objects on the, you know, the file system that you want to share between, uh, between uh, images. So how do you do that? All right? how, do you, how do you get, you know, because this is an object, this is 3 plus 4. If I sit down and inspect it, I get 7. I get the, the, the guy executed. Um, and how do I share that? Um, because it's an object inside the, and it's the standard classic small talk problem of if you have a workspace or a class that you saved in your image, how do you get it over to the other images, the other eight other images? How do you do that? You know, constant process of updating, file out, import, export, you know, as a constant process of, uh, as part of what you're doing. So this gateway node, um, I ended up being able to mount the file system. And so I set things up that when you hit an object, a gateway node, whose um, the gate is a gateway to a server file directory, I started using proxies and would go to the file system. Directories on the file system match to directories in directory nodes. Uh, files in the file system I'd look at, all right? If it had a .stoin extension, oh, that's, a, that, that's an object, all right? So reify this .stone and represent that in, in this list. If it didn't have a .stoin, then it's just a byte object and you know, you're on your own when you edit it. So what that, what that make means is my working directory for all of my projects is saved on disk in Git. And each of the images that I'm working with point to this, can point to the same location. Or you can mine in different spots, just like you do with the file systems, uh, with the Unix file systems. So now I've got a way of sharing all of my scripts among multiple, multiple images. And I find out that I'm much less worried about you know, that constant import-export, because all of the development time stuff, the, those things that are interesting to share but not part of the actual project, gets stored on disk. Things that are source code for my applications and everything else, well, that's stored in packages and stored on a, on a different cycle. But it allows you to break that cycle between saving everything and getting all your development stuff you know, stashed inside the, the, uh, your image. Um, so this is an example of basically a more complicated, I'm actually using, you know, options here. And in this particular case, I'm passing a select block to a browse command. And that select block is basically filtering for classes who uh, have dictionary in their name. And I'm looking for method um, at put. So I'm finding implementers of at put in classes that have dictionary in their name. Now this is just a small talk expression. And this little back tick here, you know, I'm, I'm cheating right now because back tick isn't part of the small talk syntax. So I don't have to come up with an escape for the back tick. But anyway, so I use that as my, my, uh, my, my uh, delimiter. And uh, the result of that is a list of methods, all right? And when you click on one of these methods, you get the source code for, for whatever it is you're looking at. And there's menus associated with this for doing more implementers and settings and, and so on. But this is the kind of stuff from a, you know, from the command line that actually we put into a script if you were doing it a lot. But, um, and that's another piece of this whole um, command line universe that, that's going on is I have a class called shell tool that implements the browse command. The browse command <coughs> itself is a block. All right, actually, which is, you, know, you execute a block that has tokens, handlines, tokens as arguments, just like scripts are. Um, but I do a lookup by the name of the command, all right? 
So that means um, that if you wanted to, in your system everywhere, say, I want browse to do something different. I want browse to automatically filter, okay? I want this to be automatic. I want to have an option that says something different. You could replace the browse command, that block, in Topaz, Topaz, to uh, be whatever browser you want. And the way these things get built, the command has a command line parser, and then you, you know, the, by convention, you build a Smalltalk API underneath your command line parser. All right? And what you have now is a class that's independent of a GUI, that's a true tool class that implements browse, and that I can call from Smalltalk anywhere else I want to. To call from Smalltalk, I say Topaz tool instance for browse, and I get the currently registered browse command, and then I start sending a message. And if that happened to be replaced by me, I get my behavior not. And that, that gives a nice clean way to manage um, you know, the whole system, the system as a whole. Um, one more thing. All right, well, this, is, this is probably the biggest bugaboo and the biggest slide and the one that you can't read. But um, documentation, all right? Class comments is not you know, a good model. You know, if it was a good model, we'd be using it all the time, and there wouldn't be a complaint to write comments that nobody needs, all right? But um, because I modeled, I was going with the object, and with basically with the uh, Unix shell, I thought, all right, I'm going to do man pages, all right? And that way, every command will have a man page. Every script has a man page. The, the template I showed you with the naked block that just had 3 plus 4 in it, there's nothing else there, that's not what you get when you say create a shell, all right? I put a whole bunch of stuff in there all right, as a template. I put a uh, command line parser, the little uh, you know, five lines of code that you need to, get to parse command lines, and a template for a man page at the bottom of the shell script. So each little block of shell script, if you send it the message, if you give it the argument minus minus help or minus h, you, can, you get the man page for that script, and, the, and the, the documentation is embedded in the script. For commands, there's other ways to, to build the man pages, but again, you know, um, this, to me, I'm building. I'm now building tutorials using man pages of my tutorial. But uh, but this gives you an idea now. So I did man browse, and I think this is 17 different subcommands on on the browse. And this is why I think you know the command line is so important. Where are you going to go on you know a standard Smalltalk system? What what set of menus are you going to start surfing, looking for the um, I want to browse the undeclared. All right. You know, there's hundreds of places in the menu. There's, there's, you know, I got 17 different commands. I'm not going to have a single browse menu on every single window that has those 17 commands. And I got probably 50 other commands in the system. So, one of the things with the command line system is you don't have to put that the son of a gun that command on the menu. You can depend. You can let the user go. I want to do this. I know the command. I'll type it in. If I don't know, I know the command, but I don't know how to use it. I'll do minus minus l. And I will get a man page on this. All right. And you know, I think this is a way to actually you know expand the, the possibilities of what you can do easily as a small talk developer in your image without you know stressing out the menu system and having where do you hang all these menus. All right. So so I you know to me this the shell is a very very important you know Toad is an implementation. All right. As far as I'm concerned, I sit down and I think you know. The, the shells have been evolving for what, 30 years or something like that? You know, 40 years? Um, there's a bunch of them out there. They all do different things, but they, they you know, have common characteristics. You know, small talk, you know, we're way behind. But this is, you know, this is only, this is, I think it's about a year old, you know, that I've been doing the shell um, for small talk. So, all right, the debugger, what does the debugger look like in Toad? Um, I've got a window here that's the stack frame, or the stack, the front of the stack. Um, here is the inspector on the stack frame, and then this is the method that the method source uh, when you click on the stack frame, this guy, this guy gets up. All right. So I broke it apart a little bit. Oh, by the way, here's how I um, launched the, the debugger. I evaled some small talk code. It's on a one line command you know, spaces, one call. Um, what I wanted to do here is show that in a Toad environment, you have the Debugger sitting here, and here's the uh, you know the uh, um, deconstructed class browser again, and this this class browser is shared by the debugger, 
So in the debugger, when I say browse class, browse full class, it just updates these four pins. And when you click on evaluate here, it updates this method pane. When you click on this guy here, it updates the method pane to look at it. And so I've now, you know, you don't have the, um, the debugger window with the method taking up a bunch of space, and then a class browser taking up a bunch of space, and then another class browser for a different guy, and another class browser, and then waiting through class browsers, you are actually being able to, you know, reuse these windows. Yes? I think this is really cool, but my question is, what happens now with this debugger, uh -huh. right, it updated that one, now you're selecting the class. This what class. happens with the, selector, with the selection in the debugger? The debugger's debugger not affected. This, this is not affected. When I click on this, I just update this window. When I click on this, I update this set of windows. Or when I say, when I generate the menu item that says um, um, browse full, it, it updates. So it, you know, so you lose the state. So that's one of the things. So in Emacs, what did you do? You would split the window, basically, and give it a copy of the buffer. So you have now two pictures of the buffer up here. So in the Toad universe, I have a menu item that is a window. So if I have a method that I'm working on or a method that I want to save, instead of building, getting a new browser to look at, I just clone the window and pull it off to the side, all right? Because there's a standard uh, code environment you got in the space around the edges. And from that window, you can, you know, from here, I can go give me the class and yeah, give the class browser back. Uh, I wonder if you, uh, did you create the need of a history uh, yeah, yeah, well, okay, so uh, yes, and the thing is, is um, at, for Toad, what I've been doing is going, I'm, not, I'm going to poke out in the areas that need to be explored, and things like, you know, history, like, you could, you could snap off a, a bunch of stack of what the windows looked like and what the objects behind them were, and then, you know, basically navigate to, you know, slide those in. That would be a possibility. I haven't done it. Because there's a whole lot of things that I haven't done, <laughs> but the point is, I want I wanted to stay, you know, keep it, uh, you know, keep it simple and not not get too complicated. Like I waited to add menus until just I think January, all right? You know, because I didn't want to early bind my implementation of menus. I wanted to wait and find out what it, what it really needed to look like. And it turned out I did things, you know, I had learned stuff. Um, this is an inspector. Um, basically, you can see all the fields in the inspector, and when you click on one of these fields. Um, the window gets replaced with, you know, that an inspector on that particular object, and you can nest down, and then there's a parent menu for popping back up. For the dot dot takes you up one, up, up one level uh, to navigate back. Um, and again, Command Shift B. So you're in the inspector. Command Shift B is the shortcut for browse class, and you can, you can search and look it up. Um, all right. So <clears throat> another thing that. I've been doing in the last couple of years is trying to do a lot of Git work, all right? And so um, Git needs to be integrated into the development environment. So I've got a project list where all the, all the projects are listed. These are all Metachelva Meta projects. And for Git support, I basically put menu item on here for being able to select a branch, do a checkout of a branch. All the standard kind of Git, Git operations can be done from within the development environment. And, um, you know, there's, oh, yeah, so. Move along. So um, the commit log browsing. So this is an example here of a commit log for a class. Okay. So the way Git works is you can actually get commit logs for a particular directory or file within anywhere within the structure of the Git directory that your Git repository. <laughs> so a class in file tree is a directory. So I can get the Git history for everything inside that particular class. And then I can go down through the, the here, when I click on this item, I get the changes for that particular shot, or right, that particular commit. And I can then look at the changes to you know, this, this browser here. So, um, you know, I've also got a merge tool that's based on the same, similar technology. So, everything that you do with Git can be done from within, within code now. And this is just a slide to show the whole enchilada, how it kind of lays out. So I've got um, Toad, there was a browse, I can browse the, the categories that are in the Toad project. When I click on this, I get the list of classes that are in that category. I click on this and go to the class browser. Here's my implementers method over here. I've actually got raw tokens selected there, and it's, you know, 
sharing the same space. Um, where are toes at, all right? Um, it's been, I finally got to the point where, okay, so you can use, somebody else can use it now. <laughs> because I've been making enough changes along the way, I didn't want to be writing, I didn't want to basically destroy whatever, what somebody may have been doing with an old toad, and I come out and go, well, everything you know is wrong, we write everything. So now I'm at the point where I really feel that, um, you know, basically I, can, I need to write more documentation, and uh, about half the commands have to be rewritten, because I, I did the uh, get up stuff in my January. So I had a bunch of commands that were there, I rewritten half of them, and then went, all right, this is, I, I'm going to release, and then I'll wait, continue working. You know, if you don't want to experience an alpha, a pre-alpha system, don't use it. <laughs> um, also, uh, this fall, there's going to be a senior project that has that has a platinum, uh, to port Toad to, uh, to, to squeak as a final squeak. And let's see. Um, if you're interested in trying out Toad, all right, that means that you need to get Gemstone. And fortunately, I have uh, put a project up probably in the last, I think it's a month and a half, Oh, GS Dev Kit up on, uh, up on GitHub, and it's an open source development kit for um, for Gemstone. It provides uh, a set of installation and management scripts for starting and stopping stones, installing different versions of Gemstone, um, and so it's a multi-stone management system. Um, it also installs Toad, so um, it includes Glass, which is the Feral Squeak compatibility layer. Um, I'm building in support for Seaside and Agree, and when I say building in support, there's Gemstone has always had ports up for these, for these projects, but the GS Dev Kit is going to have the Toad artifacts and a directory um, up, on, up on GitHub where um, documentation for installing and using Peer will be versioned along with the GS Dev Kit. Um, and then um, it uses the free for commercial use license. Um, Gemstone, and that's it. So um, I guess we have time for questions. Just to let you know, Dan Niner is going to talk, give his talk in the big room. So. Dan, it's not a question to you, but Dan Niner is going to give, a, give his talk in the big, big room. You know. Right, and I'm going to give the talk in this room. Yeah. Oh, what's your talk in here? Hmm? What's talk in here? So the talk about, in this room is about uh, how to solve your problem.